before we dive into the deep philosophy, I want to share with you an, an idea from the lighting of the menorah itself, which expresses a very important basic Jewish value. You are all familiar with the custom of increasing the number of candles each night. That happens to be a difference of opinion in the Gemara between Beisol and Beishamai. And Beishamai says that we should decrease by eight the first night, seven the next night, all the way down to one. That disagreement has been the subject of a great deal of analysis. Rosevin wrote a famous sefer called Moadim Bahalacha. It came out 50 years ago or more and has been translated into English. I guess it would be the holidays in Jewish law. He had a sense for interesting, unique ideas, and he had a way of expressing them in a very clear fashion. Um, he cites an analysis of the disagreements between Basil and Shammai throughout Shas on the basis of potentiality and actuality. The difference between looking to the inner character of a thing, its essential nature, which gives it the potentials that it has, what some philosophers call dispositions, versus what actually happens. So for example, sugar is soluble in water. Sugar will dissolve in tea. Even sugar that's sitting in your cabinet and gets burned up in a fire and never makes it into tea, we say, OK, OK, that's what happened. But had you put it into tea, it would have dissolved. Solubility is a property you don't see acting in that sugar, but it's there anyway. It's its inner potential, its inner character. And then there's what actually happens in the world to that sugar, which indeed may get burned up in a fire and thereby, thereby never dissolve in tea. So the split between Basil and Shammai is roughly Beishamai looks to the inner character, the potential, and Basil looks to the outer expression. Now this applies to the oil in the following way. They found oil that was capable of burning one night in terms of its uh, amount, and it burned for eight nights. How did that happen? There's a variety of explanations, but the simplest explanation is that it just burned more slowly. Somehow, it burned at one-eighth the uh, normal rate of consumption. So, Shammai says, when did the miracle take place? It took place before it was ignited. The oil now has a different character from normal oil. Normal oil, that's, that amount would burn in one night. This oil burns more slowly. How much miracle do you, oil do you have before you light on the first night? You have eight nights worth of miracle oil. That night, one-eighth burns. So the next night, you have seven nights worth of miracle oil. And so on decreasing. So the Shammai says, light the number of candles that expresses how much miracle oil you have. The miracle takes place in changing the essential quality of the oil. What you have is miracle oil, and the amount of miracle oil goes down from night to night. <coughs> and therefore, the decreasing number of candles. Basil, now this, this is important to get right. Basil agrees with Beishamai. You're right. The essential miracle took place internally in changing the character of the oil. And the amount of miracle oil that we had goes, goes down night by night. But that's not what we're celebrating. We're not celebrating the internal change. We're celebrating the external expression, the effect that it has. Just imagine witnessing this. The oil is put into the menorah, it's lit, and it burns all night, as it should. In the morning, there's a lot of oil left over. That's strange. Very peculiar. I light it the second night, and it burns through the second night without any new oil. Seeing the fire where there shouldn't have been one, and seeing it a third night, and a fourth night, and a fifth night, each night, the experience gets bigger, gets more, more powerful, more reinforced. Another night? Another night? So Beis Hill says we are celebrating the external 
effect of the miracle, not the essential miracle itself. <coughs> now, this difference of, of, of uh, perception, of observation, I think, it reflects uh, a, a split in values. Very often, people work to achieve internal changes. I want to become a different kind of person. I want to acquire new character traits. I want to be more elevated, more inspired, more noble. And that's good. That's right. One should do that. The question is, what is the more important, most essential effect of those internal changes. Is it that you have become a more elevated kind of person? Is that the essence of the change, the essence of the value and impact of the change? Or is it that you have a different effect on the world around you? I don't mean to say that there, it's either or. It's a question of where the emphasis should be. Acquiring good character is itself one of the 613 commandments. And that good character is something which is valuable, even if it never shows. But given that good character does show, as it will, where is the most essential effect of it? Simply becoming a, a person with greater character or that character showing its effect that it has on the world around it. And the uh, position that's taken in many, many Jewish sources is the latter. Here's a very striking example of it. Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the Torah, and he does receive it. And at the end, the people make the golden calf, and God says to Moses, Lech reid, go down, go get down because your people has become destructive, made the golden calf. The Talmudic comment on those words is, go get down from your greatness. You're going to lose a measure of greatness. Why is that? How did Moses become great? Well, he worked very hard to become great. He put in the investment to become great. Now the Jewish people have made the golden calf. So what? Why should that mean that he loses his greatness? The answer is because the greatness that he possessed shouldn't um, be described just as something he achieved. The truth is, in Jewish terms, we don't achieve anything. We make an effort, and the success is a gift that God gives us. Yes, he may not provide us with a gift if we don't make an effort. That's true. But still, the causation behind the um, possession of the gift is that God presents it as a gift. So God says, your greatness wasn't something that you created. not something that you achieved. You made an effort, and I gave it to you. Why did I give it to you? Just to reward you for your effort? Just to um, confirm your internal greatness? No. The greatness I gave you was for the sake of what you could do for the Jewish people. And now that they have deteriorated, they can't benefit from that greatness. They're not on a par to absorb that greatness, so you lose it. Because it wasn't given to you for your sake. It wasn't given to you as recognition for your efforts. It was given to you as a gift to affect them. And since they can't receive it, you lose it. This is the, a very, I would say, almost brutal example of why the external effect of this internal spiritual elevation, the external effect is the, is the, uh, the crucial value, and the internal elevation is something which is much less, uh, much less significant. I, as again, I don't say it doesn't have any value. But it's much less significant than the impact that it has externally. Um, when God tells Abraham that God is going to evaluate Sodom and Gomorrah and destroy them if they are as, as wicked as they are, seem to be, that goes through a soliloquy. Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm going to do? No. I'm not going to hide it from him because he instructs his household after him to follow the way of God, to carry out acts of justice and kindness, so I'll tell him. Chazim Seifer asks, what kind of, what kind of inner um, dialogue is this, so to speak, in God's mental processes? Shall I hide it? No, I won't hide it. What was the, what we call it Gemara, Havamina, what was the initial thought, maybe I should hide it. Why should he hide it? Chazim Seifer says something quite remarkable. He says, 
Abraham was not on a level of prophecy. He was not on a level of prophecy. Given the internal elevation that he had achieved, it was not a position where God could be expected simply to communicate to him as a prophet. But God says, why does he lack this internal elevation? Because he's dedicated to his household and to his followers to train them in belief in God and dedication to God and following God. If that's what he did and, and that's what caused him to sacrifice the inner elevation, he won't lose because of that. That's another indication of the comparative values of the two. So when Basil says you should increase the number of candles each night, because the external experience of the ignited candles grows each night, as it did in the miracle in the temple. So that, that is something which we should meditate on for ourselves. When we make progress, especially spiritual progress, we have to look at that as a divine investment which creates a certain responsibility. God is investing me with this. What does he expect in response? And one of the things he expects in response is to be sensitive to the needs of others and to do things to help inspire others. That's something you can learn from the fact that we follow the increasing order as against Beis Shammai, who said she has a decreasing order. Okay, now yesterday we said two things that I want to pick up on today. One is that for the Greeks, nature is everything. And that's why they opposed Shabbos, Bismillah, and Rosh Chodesh, because Shabbos celebrating the creation can't be naturalized. Bismillah affecting, in their eyes, mutilating the body that's produced by nature can't be naturalized. And the first of the month, which we use the power, the authority of the court to override the moon, we don't follow the astronomical signal of a new month. We have a legal way to override it, which means that we are not bound by the forces of nature. This they could not tolerate. Other commandments which could be naturalized, they could tolerate, because many religions which don't step outside the realm of nature have times when the gods tell them what to do, or food taboos, or celebrate liberation. But these three they couldn't tolerate. So to them, to the Greeks, nature is everything. To us, as I'm going to show you today, nature is, in terms of its reality, nothing. Nature is nothing. The opposition could not be more stark. It could not be more absolute. For them, it's everything, and for us, it's nothing. But the other thing that we said yesterday is that we should not set ourselves up in absolute opposition to what Greece represents. We should be able to see what's valuable in Greece, what is able to be used in a spiritually helpful way, creative way, and to incorporate it rather than simply opposing it and trying to destroy it. I want to illustrate both of those themes today. Of Dessler has an essay on nature, nature and miracles. He's using ideas which I know, because I'm a philosopher, come from a great non-Jewish philosopher, David Hume. I've asked people who knew him whether he could have read Hume. They, they doubted, but he had university students who were studying philosophy, among other things, who could have acquainted him with these ideas. And he makes <coughs> use of the ideas and molds them into a Jewish context to express a classical Jewish idea. He starts with a very simple question. Why does grass grow? Why does grass grow? So he says, you ask somebody that question, they'll tell you. Everybody knows that. You take a seed, you put it in the ground when the temperature is appropriate, usually in the spring, and it gets enough sunlight and enough moisture, and the ground is fertile, and grass grows. So the says, I'm not sure you understood my question. I didn't ask, when does grass grow? I asked, why does grass grow? You told me under what conditions grass grows. You're right. Everybody knows that, even my six-year-old grandson knows that. But I want to know what makes it grow, what causes it to grow, what brings about the growth. You just told me when I can expect it to happen. That doesn't tell me what makes it happen. So the respondent says, oh, that's what you meant. Oh, I'll tell you. You see, you put this, the, the seed into the ground, 
and little tendrils come out, and they absorb moisture together with particles from the dirt, and that moisture is then absorbed upwards into the body of the seed, and that stimulates it to uh, send out a, a shoot uh, going towards the surface, and then when the shoot reaches the surface, it branches out. So it says, oh, I see. When you put the seed in the ground, the tendrils come out, what we call roots, and when the roots come out, they absorb, and when they absorb, I hear you, it's all very interesting. Aren't you just telling me more of what happens? Are you telling me why it happens? What makes it happen? What pushes it to happen? What causes it to happen? He's giving me a more detailed description of what, in fact, takes place. I agree that it's accurate, and it's, it's interesting to know. It may help you have better, uh, better grass in the future, but that wasn't my question. My question is, what makes it happen? I say, well, actually, you know, you're right, and until modern science, ha, huh, capital M, capital S, you know, 16-point uh, font, uh, modern science has explained that to us. You see, everything's built out of molecules. And these molecules interact with one another. And when this molecule comes in contact with that molecule, they bind and they release energy. And when this one combines with that one, it combines with another one, which could be used for building a cell wall, and so forth and so on. We have a very detailed description of how the molecules interact, and that's how it happens. Can you hear of Dessler's next parry? Aren't you just giving me a more detailed picture of what happens? Okay, now you have very powerful microscopes, maybe even electron microscopes, and you give me a more detailed description of What's happening? But I didn't ask what's happening. I asked why it's happening. What's making it happen? Now, let's just skip to the end. Suppose you get down to particles. What are you going to say? Well, you know, um, uh, electrons have negative charge. Yeah, what does that mean? So try to push them together. They don't want to get together. The closer they get, the harder you have to push. Why? What makes that happen? What can you say? That's what they do. That's what we tried experiments, and that's what they do. Electron and proton attract one another because one's positive, one's negatively charged. That just means that when, ne when they have different charges, they attract. When they're the same charges, they repel. In the bottom, when you get all the way to the bottom, all you're describing is what happens, what things happen. You have no description of why they happen or what makes them happen. That's all science gives you. As a category, it describes what happens. It never describes why things have to happen, what forces them to happen, what causes them to happen. That means in the end, there's no answer to this question. Now, this is a parody of Hume. Hume had much more uh, detailed and in certain ways deeper things to say. But it is a bona fide position in contemporary philosophy, one of the many, as it is true in every philosophical subject today. There are many positions, all contradicting one another. There's no uniform uh, agreement or clarity on any significant philosophical issue. Uh, if you want to see that in detail, take a look at the Stanford uh, Encyclopedia of Philosophy online. Look up any subject, and you'll see at least five positions on any subject. But this is one of them, that we live in a world where things happen. They happen in patterns. They happen repeatedly, and that's all. Beyond that, we have nothing else to use to describe what makes the world go. OK, so if I ask, why do things follow a certain sequence, the answer is, they just do. Exactly right. They just do. We see that they do. We get used to it. We form habits of perception and habits of expectation. But beyond that, I say, I release the rock and it falls to the ground. What makes that happen? The force of gravity. Uh-huh. And what's that? What is that? Can you weigh it, chew it, ignite it, dissolve it with acid, paint it? It's just a way of saying that when you let rocks go, they go down. That's all. There's nothing more to it than that. And if there's something more, you tell me what it is. Tell me what it is. It's more than just that when you let things go unsupported, they go down. So that being the case, what people call nature is pretty thin. When you ask people what they mean by nature, usually they talk about the laws of nature. But now the laws of nature are just descriptions of what happens. 
what happens over and over again. What happens in certain categories? When I put the raw egg in boiling water, five minutes later, it's hard boiled. If we're not high up on a mountain, in which case it comes out soft boiled, and so forth and so on. That's just what happens. OK, so then, if that's all there is to nature, what's the importance of the concept? What's the impact of the concept? In particular, if somebody says, I don't believe in miracles because I believe in the laws of nature, what is he saying? He's saying, well, things always go together this way. Translation, things have always gone together this way. Or the things we've looked at when we were watching always went together this way. So therefore, OK, so when you have been watching, that's what you have seen, how things go together. Therefore, in another case, it couldn't happen differently. Why not? Why couldn't it happen differently? You have seen when it goes together this way, and now someone tells you, in this case, it went, went together differently. What have you got against that? What can you use as a defense against such an idea if, by nature, all you mean is, this is what we see happening? So now he saw something else happening. That means that nature as laws, as laws, really isn't anything. It really isn't anything. And this, what I'm providing you now with, is a philosophical perspective. From a philosophical perspective, the idea that there are laws <laughs> above and beyond just what happens isn't real. Now, Rav Dester has a way of making this vivid because he was familiar with 20th century technology. I don't think the idea is different from what you have in previous generations, but it's a way of making it vivid. A video, what they used to call a moving picture. What is a video composed of? It's composed of separate pictures, which are um, projected rapidly so that the eye doesn't see them separately. And the eye takes in and the brain takes in a series of pictures. Each picture is an absolutely separate reality. There's no real connection between one picture and another picture. Think of the editor of a video. What does he do? He reviews it and he says, oh, that's a terrible piece. Cut that out. You know what? Let's change the order. Let's take this piece over here, put this piece in over here, and change the order. Let's slow this one down and speed that one up. Why? Because they're all separate entities. They're all separate identities. No picture has any relationship to the next picture. They say, why is it that in the, in the, in the video, I saw the arrow gr arching gracefully from one place to another? That's because the editor decided to keep in that sequence of pictures. He could have chopped it up. Like some people have told me there's something called MTV, where like every quarter second the, 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 the picture changes. He could have chopped it up that way. He just decided not to. He could have decided at the highest point of the arrow's flight to stick in, go get a Coke. You know, just subliminal advertising, which I'm told didn't really work. But uh, it was a big thing in the 60s, you know, <laughs> manipulating people's minds. Stick one in and says, go get a Coke. Why not? They're all separate entities. So now, Odessa says, our world is like that. Our world is like that. Each moment is a separate identity. Each moment is a separate identity. And there's no real connection between one moment and the next moment. So now, I take this stone, I let it go, and it falls. It gradually falls to the ground. Pick it at a halfway point. Why is it here? So we naively say, you know why it's here? Very simple, because two seconds before, it was up there, and I let go, and it's been falling. And gravity's been pulling it down, and that's how far it got. From this point of view, that's not an accurate explanation. After all, what you saw in the, in the video two, minutes uh, two seconds before is a separate picture. And the picture halfway down is a separate picture. There's no real connection between them. No picture has an effect on another picture. You can't say this picture is the way it is because of the previous picture. If anything, this picture is the way it is because the, the editor decided that he wants the, the sequence to go that way. He could have changed it any way he wanted. Our world is like that also. The reason that the, the stone is at this level halfway through the sequence is because God created it there at that point, at that moment. He created it at the top when I let it go. 
and he created at each instant on the way down. I know the time could be continuous. You could translate it into continuous time as well, even though it's not agreed that it's continuous. It goes down instant by instant, and each instant is a separate creation, and that means there's no real connection between one instant and the next instant. There are just patterns. There are just patterns. That means we are living in a divine, divinely, a divine production continuously. God is producing the world and producing it according to certain patterns continuously. Why he does that is something which we will talk about in the session. But that's what we're living in. There's no room for nature now. If you want to use the word nature, I'm quoting the Chazanish now, if you want to use the word nature at all, the word nature refers to the patterns that God uses in constantly recreating the world. They're his patterns, and he decides to put them into those patterns so, so that we will be able to appreciate what's going on and react to it, and react to it, but no more than that. So there's no room for the idea of nature as absolute. There's certainly no room for compressing capital G-O-D into little G-O-D and making little G-O-D an aspect of nature, and that being the explanation of the way the world works. There's no internal explanation of the way the world works. The world works the way it does because God creates it according to certain patterns. And that's all. So that means that from a Jewish point of view, the idea of nature is, the, the Greek idea of nature is utterly rejected. Utterly, utterly rejected. As I said, if you want to use the word nature, then you're referring to simply uh, the more constant categories and patterns in the way God creates the world. Okay, so that sets it up as if it were an absolute opposition. Now, if that's the case, what positive could we recover from the Greek idea and use positively? What will happen to what I said yesterday that the Gemara says that if they tell you that there's wisdom among the non-Jews, believe it. What kind of wisdom can you have if they are dealing with a non-reality? Well, let's make the question very practical. This is the way when people first come across this idea. This is one of the ways they try to object to it, and it's not, not illogical. Uh, you have a headache, do you take an aspirin? They'll ask me. You're the guy with the funny hat, the long coat. You say you believe this stuff. When you have a headache, do you take an aspirin? I say, yes. Well, why? Why? The aspirin can't do anything. God's the one who's creating the world moment by moment. He makes it the way it is moment by moment. So if you don't believe that the aspirin causes the headache to go away, if you don't believe in anything causing or making anything else happen, why would you invest in that? The answer is because God is interested in continuing the appearance of nature the appearance of causation. God is interested in continuing the patterns. He wants to continue the patterns. So I know that even though taking the aspirin can't cause the headache to go away, but I know that taking the aspirin is associated with the headache going away because God wants me to live that association. He has a purpose in that. So even though it's not real, I can use it to predict what's going to happen. And in practical terms, that may be all I need in a particular case. All I need to know is what's going to happen, not why it happens, not how it happens, but what's going to happen. And I think, frankly, that we are in that situation very often. Uh, I saw one, I'm, I'm not a historian. I, when I say things about history, it's what I read what some historians said. I saw one historian say that in ancient times, when they were trying to figure out how a human being works, and as you know, from vocabulary that the heart was thought of as the seat of thinking, deciding. What's the brain for? One theory was the brain is a radiator. It just gets rid of heat. You know, it's got lots of surface area. It's a very small organ, but because of its convolution, it's got lots of surface area, so it can get rid of a lot of heat. And it just, it's a heat regulator for the body. That's all. Did they have a clue where ideas were coming from? Thoughts, speech, and all the rest? Didn't have a clue. Did it matter? Did it matter? So-and-so said, I promise you I'll do X. He said, oh, you thought it was coming from the heart. It's really coming from the brain. So what? He said he promised. I'm going to hold him responsible. I'm going to judge his morality on that basis, whether it comes from the heart or from the brain. Very often in practical life, in relationships, 
in morality. We don't care about the inner mechanics, whether we got them right, haven't got them right. All we care about is, can we predict what's going to happen? Do we know what difference will follow? Not what difference it makes, what difference it will follow. And yes, I know from experience that when I take aspirins, my headaches go away because God wants that pattern to be preserved. He wants us to see that pattern. So someone who engages in scientific research, I say to him two things. Number one, you don't understand what you're doing. You don't understand what you're investigating. You think you're investigating the necessities of the natural world around you? I know that you're, you're inve investigating the patterns that God wants to project for human experience. But for the very reason that he wants to project those patterns, your results are very important to me because you are giving the best description of those patterns, and we know we can rely on those patterns to, per to perpetuate themselves almost always, except when God decides that he doesn't want that to happen. And then we have something which, which we call a miracle because God decides in those rare cases that the, that the event should not follow that pattern. So the scientific investigation, even if conducted by an atheist, proud, assertive, aggressive, intemperate, not always focused atheist, of which there are many, um, will make no difference because if he's done his experiments in the pattern that God wants to re replicate, then indeed his findings will be very practically useful to us. So this is a way in which I don't have to reject the scientific effort. I don't have to reject the scientific attitude. I just have to realize that the ultimate reality is not according to the assumptions that the scientific attitude, uh, scientific attitude would make. But as far as their results are concerned, they can be very useful and can be um, accepted as valid ways to predict the way in which God will make the world work. Are we together so far? Okay, now why is God interested in this? Why would God want the world to follow certain patterns? The deepest reason, I believe, is this. We are put into the world to make free decisions, to take responsibility for our decisions, to work on moral development, sensitivity, spiritual development, sensitivity. You can't make a free decision unless the world is very, very highly repetitive. Very highly repetitive and patterned. Because when you do something, what you do is you move your body. But when you make a choice how to move your body, the choice is based on what you anticipate the consequences to be. You're writing an email, right? You're pushing buttons. You're pushing buttons. Okay, I have voice dictated emails, so I don't have to push the buttons. I could just dictate it from, you know, uh, by voice. But there were, many people still do actually press buttons on computers. You've probably seen that. Right? So you're moving your fingers. That's all you're doing, pressing down little metal buttons. How did you decide to press this button? Because I'm spelling this word, and this word is going to be transmitted to someone in San Francisco, and then he's going to take those words and go to the court and make a deposition. Otherwise, I wouldn't push the button. Suppose I discovered that the program isn't working. I'm not going to push those buttons. <laughs> I'm going to fix the program. Because I'm not deciding to move my fingers. I'm deciding to send an email and communicate information to someone in San Francisco. If the world weren't regular, if it weren't patterned, if it didn't follow certain categories regularly, I wouldn't be able to make any decisions at all because the decisions are decisions for consequences, not decisions for bodily motions. There are exceptions. You may move your arms to give yourself exercise, but that's a very, very small part of human life. So imagine that uh, sometimes when you press the Q button, a Q appears on the screen, and sometimes um, Coca-Cola starts flowing from the screen, and sometimes uh, you know, a dollar comes out of a slot, and uh, sometimes uh, a flame comes out and, and then burns a hole in your, in your sleeve. And you could never decide whether to press the Q button or not because you don't know what's going to happen. You're not pressing the Q button for pressing the Q button. You're pressing it to get certain results. And those results have to be regularly patterned. Otherwise, you can't expect what's going to happen. So God invests in the regularity of the world so that we can make decisions and be responsible for those decisions. That means that, at least as we perceive it, those patterns have to be held. If we're not perceiving, if we're not the ones, we don't, we're not attentive to a particular aspect of reality, anything could be going on. 
We have no commitment to what's happening when we're not looking. Something that happens when, when it has no effect on, what, uh, on what's uh, happening to us when we're not looking. There's no commitment to that. God could be playing with that in any way that, that's uh, to his pleasure. Because the only reason for the patterns is for us to be able to use them to make decisions for which we could be responsible. Now, that being the case, we still have no commitment to nature, but we can rely on the patterns to repeat themselves. One other aspect of this, uh, of this idea, we said there's no causation. Nothing causes anything. They're just instants of time, and each instant is a separate entity which has its own character, just that God creates them in patterns. What about my decisions? I decide to raise my arm, and my arm goes up. Isn't it at least in that case that my decision raises my arm? According to this picture, the answer is no. Not even in that case. Does my decision cause my arm to go up? That's not correct. Rather, I decide, and God says, since I want you to be able to trust your deciding, when you decide to raise your arm, I will cause your arm to go up. And I'll cause it to go up regularly. And in that way, you'll know that when you go through that mental process called deciding, you can decide for your arm to go up because it will go up. That means every human action is a partnership. Every human action is a partnership. Partnership between the person and God. You want to talk about having a relationship with God, I don't think anything could get more personal, more direct, more constant, and more intimate that, than when I raise my arm it's God and me cooperating on that venture. I made the decision, and he's making the arm go up. That's a constant joint production in every human action. So the idea of there being a freestanding nature that controls everything is something that we cannot, we certainly, we cannot accept. It's simply not correct from our point of view. But as I said, the investigation of nature, which is a Greek impulse, is something which we can, we can make use of, even though we have to disagree with them in terms of the inner understanding of what is actually going on. I want to just finish by giving you a comparison. How many of you here heard the, of the film The Matrix? OK. Uh, the Matrix, was, uh, Matrix attracted a lot of attention, even among professional philosophers. There's at least one volume that's all essays by various philosophers on what to make out of that film, how to, to uh, understand what message could be gleaned from it. Many people saw the matrix as a kind of challenging puzzle. Maybe the world isn't real. There aren't any tables, there aren't any chairs. Nobody ever went to the moon. Maybe it's all a mistake because we are just all circuits in some super advanced computer. James Pryor at that time, I think it was at Princeton, I think now maybe at NYU, outstanding contemporary philosopher, said, that's the wrong message. It's the wrong message, the wrong question, the wrong answer. The matrix poses the question, not maybe everything doesn't exist, it's all an illusion, a, a dream, a mistake. It poses the question, what are we really? Let's take a comparison. Up until maybe 150 years ago, this table is solid wood. Solid wood meant packed full, chock full of wood. No empty spaces. That's what solid meant. That's what it meant to Aristotle, that's what it meant to everybody. Until molecular theory, now of course everybody knows because you were taught it at four years of age, the table is almost 99%, more than 90% empty space. Atoms have a nucleus at the center and Electrons, if you think of them as real things, and haven't done quantum mechanics yet, and lots of space in between. Have we discovered that really there aren't any tables? Tables are a mistake, just a dream, an illusion. There aren't any tables? No. We now think we know better what tables are. Tables aren't, a wooden table isn't chock full of wood. A wooden table is almost all empty space. That's what a table is. Pryor said that that's the way, by the way, he spells his name P R Y O R, if you want to look it up. James Pryor. Um, he said the challenge of the, of the matrix is not maybe there aren't any tables, maybe we didn't go to the moon. The challenge is what is a table? 
Maybe a table really is an electric circuit in a giant computer. Maybe that's what it is. I thought that were Would that be more shocking than discovering that it's almost all empty space? It's just changing our conception of what the thing is. There's no danger here that maybe we don't live in a real world. We live in a real world, but it's run by and realized by processes and features that we were totally unaware of. And now we have a better understanding, if, 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 the, if the matrix were correct, we have a better understanding of what the world is made of and what the, the laws are that run it. But no more than that. And I, I, th I applaud Pryor's uh, analysis. I would point out that discovering that, including discovering that there are programmers running it, isn't completely different from discovering that the world has a God and also discovering that it isn't made the way you thought it was. It's made out of divine will and being run by a super programmer. The idea of the discovery isn't so different from the reality that we are trying to communicate.